Well, hey, Lakepoint family, welcome to Church Online. Hey, if we haven't met, my name is Carlos and I serve as pastor of Digital Ministries. And right now, please let us know where you are joining us from and drop it in the chat. We want to hear from you. And who knows, if you drop it in the chat, you might just get a shout out just like Hong Chapman from Denver joining us right now. And also shout out to Mitchell Ingram from Houston, Texas and Kathy Ryan from Orange, Florida. Hey guys, welcome. Thank you for being here. And if at some point during the service, you need someone to process with or have a specific prayer request, our team is actually ready to pray with you and for you. And so if you're joining us on our church online platform, you can just hit the prayer button as well on your screen. Or if you're on Facebook or YouTube, feel free to just share your request in the chat section. Or you can also just text the word prayer to 20411 or visit church slash Prayer. And like I said, we have an amazing team of Church Online volunteers who are ready to connect with you. Also, Lake Point family, don't forget to share this live stream with your friends and family. Hey, we believe, and we'll say this often, that life change starts with an invitation. And God wants to use you to be a blessing to those around you. Okay, well, Lake Point family, right now it is time. Let's get rid of any distractions and let's head into a time of worship together.
join the sound of heaven that going on, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. When we join the sound of heaven, our preferences fade away. Our focus is fixed on the God who saves, who is worthy, who is set apart. He is holy. So we say, heaven, come down. Meet us here. There's power in our praise today as we call on heaven. Something changes in the atmosphere. I struck wonder as the Lord draws near. There's a melody clothed in majesty and praise, and it comes from you. Our prayer together to say.
We believe there's power in our praise as we unite with the sound of heaven singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. As Mary said, we're so glad you joined us today. We're going to end our services a little different this weekend. And so we have the opportunity to worship together both as we sing and as we give. As our ushers make their way forward to the front, we give out of an overflow for God has blessed us and we trust him with faith to give and Lake Point Church you are a faithful church a generous church who says God we trust in you and God our giving is an act of worship so there's two easy ways to give today you can give in the buckets as they make their way down your row or the easiest and best way is to text the word give to the number 20411 but as we continue to worship today we do that both as we sing and as we give an offering of praise to you, God, for we trust in you. We know who you are. He's a faithful father, perfect in all of his ways. God, we worship you as we continue to sing. We sing. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the land. all who've gone before us and all who will believe sing the song of ages to the land one voice your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name always stands above them all all thrones all thrones and dominion
Hey, Lake Point family, welcome to Church Online. Hey, if we haven't met, my name is Carlos and I serve as pastor of Digital Ministries. Hey, let me just take a moment and encourage you and challenge you this way today through the Word of God. And this is Romans chapter 12, verse 10. And it says this, it says, be devoted to one another in love and honor one another above yourself. And this is what this means. You and I are called to be like Jesus and to be like Jesus is to love God and love other people. But for you to love others, you need to actually know other people and be known by them. You and I, scripture says, we're wired for intimacy. And somebody said it this way, intimacy can be described as into me see, or basically somebody that can see into me or actually see me for who I am. And the reason this is important today more than ever is because especially in our culture and time, we naturally drift towards isolation. And so today I want to gently nudge you to get out of your comfort zone and invite you to resist the temptation of isolation. Let me ask you this, who are those few people that you are doing life with? Maybe a friend, a family member, a neighbor, and as a church, we're here to help you do that. We have life groups, whether that's in person or online, where people connect with each other and do life together. And it all starts with one step. And so if that is you and you want to find your life group, just we want to make it as easy as possible. Just text the word group to 20411. Well, Lakeman family, God is doing so much in our church this season. It's so exciting. And if you don't know this, we are one church with seven physical locations and a diverse global family connecting from more than 100 countries through church online. And I want to take a moment and briefly highlight one of our YouTube comments from our worship and prayer nights a week ago. This person says, I went to church tonight as a single mom with my toddler and my spirit feels refreshed. I asked him to stir fresh affections in me and he did. She says, thank you, my Jesus. Also, I watched my three-year-old lift his hands in worship and pray with his eyes closed and hands in prayer position. Jesus will do more with his life than in mine. Man, I love that. That is just one story of so many. And I love that today as a church, we get to connect, engage, and reach people in, in person, but also through our digital ministries like church online, social media, podcasts, and more. So Lake Point family, thank you for being a part of what God is doing through Lake Point as you join our online weekend services, as you serve, and as you give, and as you become a part of what God is doing through our church in this season. Hey, right now, there is more happening in the life of our church. And of course, we do not want you to miss out. So let's go to LP News. Hey, Lake Point, we're the McCartneys, and we're so glad you're here today. Hey, Robin, before we do anything else, let's talk about this awesome new gear yeah, we're wearing from the merch shop. shop. Isn't it amazing? Yes. Well, obviously it looks great, but also they're great conversation starters to invite someone new to church. So true. Plus, all proceeds from these items go straight toward funding Lake Point Missions projects. How great is that? I love it. The best. These and more items are available for purchase next weekend in campus lobbies. Items are first come, first serve, and we're so excited to see everyone rocking their new LP gear. If you're a young adult feeling called into ministry or you know someone who is but don't know where to begin, we want to help. Applications for the Lake Point School of Ministry are open for full-time residents and summer interns. Yeah, and the Lake Point School of Ministry is designed to build up the next generation of confident leaders. Apply today to gain hands-on experience in theological training. Applications close on February 28th, so visit lakepoint.church ministry for all the details. Hey men, do you need an idea for a night out with your wife or fiance? I've got you covered. Marriage Night is coming up on February 23rd at all six campuses and online. Mark and I enjoy this event every year. We laugh, meet new people, and love hearing from guest speakers, such as Levi and Jenny Lusco. So check out lp.events to register today. Now let's dive into week four of our Regret Proof Your Life series. Uh, man, uh, 
Dude, I just wanna, uh, if, I, if I just seem a little, a, a little up, I just need you to know, as of about noon today, I am a brand new dog owner. It is a big, this is a big day in the Howerton household. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce y'all. Uh, so this is, uh, Jana named him, this is Mr. Bingley. I just gotta get this out of here. This is, she, Jana named the dog, is scarcely larger than a hamster. The dog's name, again, Mr. Bingley from Pride and Prejudice. Jana named this guy. Be praying for us. I'm gonna be dealing with this lie. I hear ya, I hear ya, okay. I'll, I'll be dealing with this little hamster for the next little bit. I do just wanna go ahead and, uh, so I got all three of my kids have the flu right now. They are all right now at home watching daddy holding Mr. Bingley. I almost forgot his name. He's brand new. And uh, this is, I do just want to show, this is Mr. Hudson. Uh, hi, Mr. Hudson. Uh, Hudson, right after, this is such a pastor's kid story. Right after we brought home Mr. Bingley, Hudson wanted to read him a Bible story. And, uh, and, and what he did is he had great intentions, great intentions, but his Bible story was good night moon. And so this is him reading this. And, but I just, will y'all help me just say hi to my kids and welcoming Mr. Bingley to the Howardson family. Hey, y'all, good to see y'all. Awesome. All right, well, hey, uh, here's where today. We got a lot more important things to get to than Mr. Bingley, a lot more important. Uh, we are here, let me just say it like this. Um, if I was going to preach one sermon and only one sermon to Christians. This one sermon has the potential to have the greatest outcome long-term in your life more than anything else I'll preach this entire year. I I really believe this. If you were to miss on every other habit of the Christian life, but get this one thing, this one thing will lead to all the other things naturally falling into place. On the other hand, if you were to get and really start to step into everything else but miss this one thing. This one thing would result in everything else eventually failing. Now, this is the most important week, in my opinion, of a series that we've been calling Regret Proof Your Life. I have a picture to give you an image of what this series is. This isn't, by the way, this is an actual real picture of a real dude. This is a real thing, not staged. This is a good image for what this series is, okay? No regrets, no regrets, okay? I can tell how smart you are by how long it took you to laugh at the picture. That's what I can figure out. And what we wanna do right now is we wanna step into the scriptures and go, man, how can I, my job as a pastor is to prepare you for your final day. How can we live this day in a way that we won't regret on that day? This one thing is it. Now, here's the regret. It's the top regret of somebody on their deathbed. And here's what it is. It's the regret, I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. I'll just say it to you like this. You just need to know this. I've been with people. As a pastor, you're just there in weird moments. So I've been with people at their deathbed. Can I just tell you something that you'll notice? Nobody on their deathbed says, bring me my diploma. Nobody says, bring me my gun collection. Nobody says, bring me all the sports cards or my sports car. Nobody says, can I just see my house one last time? What everyone on their deathbed says is, bring me the people that I love. That is the number one thing. Don't wait until your final day to realize what was most important in life. Now, what I wanna do right now because of the the urgency of this, I gotta go a little faster than I usually do. I wanna give you a theology behind. We have a reason for understanding why that's the thing that everybody wishes on their deathbed. So let me give you a little theology before we get into sociology and, and practicology. So here we go, number one. Let me just say it like this. So when we get into the Bible, what we see in Genesis 1 is God begins to create. And as God creates, he's creating in a pattern. And he creates and everything's good because God's good and everything flowed out of his nature. So when you read Genesis, what you'll notice is there's a very distinct pattern in Genesis 1. God creates and declares, creates, declares, creates, declares. Seven times God creates and then he pronounces a declaration over what he created And the declaration over and over again, I'll just show it to you. He says, and God saw that it was good. Seven times God says this. It was good, 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 it was good. But then you get to the end of the creation story, the mandate, the the narrative. And there was one thing that God looks at and he goes, that's the only thing that's not good. And you'll see it right here. I want you to see it. The Lord God said, it's not good for a man to be alone. 
So I just wanna point this out. Sometimes we'll do this as Christians and we'll go, man, what it's really about is me and Jesus. Like as long as I just have a really intimate relationship with God, well, that's what matters. Well, think about this. Adam was literally walking step by step with God in the garden by his side and it wasn't enough. It was still not good. And so God looks at a person alone and says, that's not good. Now, there's a theology to understand this. You gotta get this, like, let me go a layer deeper with you for our our Bible scholars here for a second. What the Bible says is that you and me were created in the, quote, image of God. And what the Bible says is that God is a trinity. That means that um, in, in the words of the old confession that God is one in essence, three in person, but one in essence. In other words, God is one what, but he's three who's, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now what that means is that God for all of eternity, God has existed in relationship, and you were created in the image of God who is a relationship. What that means is that you were designed to live in relationship. In fact, You can't live a fulfilled life outside of relationship because you're rebelling against the nature of the God in whose image you were created. So I just wanna say something just very blunt, very urgent on your life. You need to know this is an inviolable law of human nature. Inviolable law right here, this will always be true. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of your relationships. Boil everything down. That is the inviolable law of human existence. Now. Um, I love it as a pastor when, uh, when sociology confirms theology, there is an absolute mountain of evidence sociologically that this is true. I'm just gonna riff off a couple of them, okay? Um, in life, there was a Harvard study years ago that found that if you belong to no groups, like no uh, relational groups, and then you decide to join one, you cut your risk of dying in the next year in half. Another study found that group connected people with unhealthy habits like smoking, poor diet, heavy drinking, they consistently outlive disconnected people with otherwise healthy lifestyle habits. So it's like relationally connected, bad habits win, relationally isolated, good habits lose. What about marriage? Let's think about marriage. Um, Duke University, the sociologists did this study and here's what they, uh, they found. They, found, they studied husbands and wives. They found that whether wives feel satisfied with the sex, romance, and passion in their marriage is 70% dependent on the quality of the couple's friendship. Friendship. Now, you may hear that and some of you are like, oh yeah, well that's, that's the women. They, you know, they're more relationally oriented and you know, women and men are different. That's obviously true. And you're like, oh, you know, men, men are different, it's gonna be different. Well, here's what they found for men whether they are satisfied with the sex, romance, and passion in their marriage is 70% dependent upon the quality of their friendship. It actually turns out that a good marriage really is friends with benefits. That's what we find out, okay? Now, just gotta gotta get that in there. Uh, What about age? Let's think about age. This Harvard study, here's what it found. The single best predictor, number one, more than anything else, of health and happiness at age 80 was not wealth or professional success it was your relationships at age 50. Listen, I could literally go on and on and on and on, but what you're gonna see over and over is this is an inviolable law of human nature. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of your relationships. Now, really quick, I I felt led to do this in sermon prep, and if I feel like the Spirit's leading me to do something, I'm gonna do it right now. I need to address our men. So let me just right now address the men of Lake Point Church. So there's probably a dude that was clapping and as soon as I got to the, I'm addressing men, he stopped really fast, okay. So here's here's what happened. So let let me just address men because I'm gonna make a generalization. I'm I'm assuming we're all big boys and girls. We understand that like some gender generalizations are generally true. I'm gonna make one. In general, women are more relational and men are more functional. In general, not always. In general, Men are more task oriented. Women are more people oriented in general. Men, here's what's happening to a lot of guys in our generation right now, is you're in a situation where like, your wife is the one who has to pull you and drive you and like pulling teeth to get you to do anything relationally. She is driving the relationships of your family. 
And so what happens is she's relationally connected, you're relationally isolated. She senses that that's not okay and that you're not okay. And so she's trying to like pull you into relationships. Now, man, here, if that happens, one of two things is gonna happen in your marriage. You just need to know this. Number one, uh, either she's gonna be looking at you and what, what you will do is you'll go, hey, not only do I need you to be my wife, I also need you to carry the relational burden of being my entire friend group. Can I just tell you, she can't do that. She's a wife, she's not 10 people. The other thing that's gonna happen is if that doesn't happen, by the way, I'm gonna need my prompter and not the video right here. I need my little notes. The other thing that's gonna happen is if you do that, then you're gonna have like, some of you, here's a spot. You got three friends. It's like your wife and then you got three friends. Your three friends are Jim Beam, Jose Cuervo, and Jack Daniels. Those are your three friends. So what's gonna happen to you eventually is she's gonna see this. She's gonna be going, dude, my husband's melting down, but watch this. Because she's the weaker vessel, I'm quoting the Bible, don't get mad at me. Because in general, women are weaker than men. She's gonna have an anxiety as she watches her isolated husband begin to melt down. So there's an anxiety that rises in her. Here's her anxiety. She's looking at you and she's going, my husband's not okay. He's not doing great. I don't know what to do. Melting down, spiraling out of control. But watch this. She's scared to rebuke you because you're bigger than her, stronger than her, louder than her, and madder than her. And she's like, dude, if I step into this, is he gonna blow up at me? Men, you just need to know this. Something inside the spirit of a wife goes to peace when her husband is surrounded by strong, godly men who will call out the best in him and call him back when the worst comes out. Your wife needs this from you. So let me, some of you are like, well, 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 I don't need that. I don't need that. Like, dude, I'm tough. I'm isolated. I, Lone Ranger. Okay, can I just say this? Don't try to be tougher than Jesus. Don't try to be tougher than Jesus. When Jesus embarked on his life's mission, he's baptized by the Holy Spirit. The very next thing he does, as soon as he's baptized by the Spirit and goes out to accomplish his mission, is he gathers around him 12 dudes. Somebody somebody made the joke one time, nobody talks about Jesus' great miracle of having 12 close friends in his 30s. That's a great joke right there. Jesus goes out, gathers 12 dudes around him, and he goes, hey, if I'm gonna accomplish a mission, I'm gonna need some men. Men, in your life, God has called you to do great things for the glory of God and the good of people in this world. If you're gonna accomplish your mission, you're gonna need some men. Do not model your life around a lone ranger. Model your life around your surrounded savior who gathered men around him in relationship. Why? Because you were designed for this. You were the same dude that clapped at the beginning, clapped at the end, good on him, good on him. So so the quality of your life is determined by the quality of your relationships. Now, here's what you also need to notice from Genesis. Check this out, this is really interesting. Have you ever noticed that Satan doesn't appear in the book of Genesis until after the relationship happens? So like Satan's leaving Adam alone, then God creates the woman, and then all of a sudden Satan rushes forward. Here's how it works. First comes the wedding, then comes the war. Satan rushes in to attack your relationships because he goes, if I can mess up the relationships, that's the primary way that God will work in their lives. So let me cut God off at his primary point of attack. Now, when it comes to this, it's like, man, what may rise in you is you may be going, okay, I need to rush towards relationships. Now, let me help and pastor us from the scriptures before we just rush forward foolishly. There is something, there are all these things, I call them dumb things smart Christians believe. Let me give you a dumb thing that smart Christians believe. Dumb thing smart Christians believe, oh, we should treat everybody equally because people are people. You gotta treat everybody equally because people are people. Ah, wrong, terrible idea. Do you know what I wouldn't do if my son Hudson had three animals in front of him, like a snake, a puppy, and a chupacabra? I wouldn't be like, oh, treat them all equally. Animals are animals. No, no, you gotta treat them according to their character. You don't treat people equally, you treat people according to their character. You'll even notice, watch this, Jesus had the wisdom to do this. Check this out in John chapter two. It says, but Jesus didn't, there's an important word, trust them because he knew all about people. No one needed to tell him about human nature for he knew what was in each person's heart. Check this out. Yes, we're called to love everybody. No, we're not called to trust everybody. 
You don't treat people uh, according to, to, you treat people according to their character and how much trust they have. Now, here's why I say this, okay? Some of you, you're just naturally more naive people. Uh, your default mode, and by the way, God bless you. We love you. Sometimes you make the world go round. You make, you know, snowflakes and rainbows and sparkles and all that thing. Okay, but, but some of you, um, your default mode is full trust. Everybody you meet is your new best friend. You always believe the best about anybody. Whenever somebody has a moral character mishap, you're like, oh, let's get, just give them another chance. That's probably not who they really are. You're the person who walks into the living room and you uh, grab your husband. Babe, there's a Nigerian prince who really needs help. <laughs> you're this person, okay? Some of you, you just, you're, you're a little naive and trusting. Now, on the other hand, some of you are not naive and trusting. You're paranoid. Uh, your default mode is suspicion. Um, you operate in the world on the principle of everyone around me is guilty until they prove themselves innocent. Uh, one of your kids could walk in with like dis, you know, dislocated shoulder, or arm, like compound fracture, bleeding out the side, yelling for daddy. And you'd be like, what's your angle? What do you really want? You know, that's kind of your, like, this is just kind of your mode. Um, do, you know, <laughs> do you know how to tell these people? They're all the men who make sure they sit on the ends of the rows. And right now, you know, you're paranoid because I pointed out that you're a man who always sits on the end of the row. Uh-huh, I saw that. And that dude probably has a firearm too right now. That, all of you, you, you're the dudes that sit on the ends of the rows with firearms and you trust absolutely no one, okay? And because of that, you end up just totally isolated. Now, check this out. Christians, we don't wanna be naive and trust everybody. We don't wanna be paranoid and trust nobody. We wanna be discerning and trust the right people. So let me show you this. These are the relationships. This is a relational grid. This is, listen, what I'm about to say changed my life. My life was never the same after I got this biblical grid. If you get this, change your life, your life will never be the same. You will avoid more pain and put yourself in a position to receive more blessing by this one grid from the book of Proverbs than nearly anything I can teach you. So check this out. There are three kinds of people according to the book of Proverbs. There are wise people, foolish people, and evil people. Fun little uh, fun little assignment. There are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. You can read one proverb per day. That's what Billy Graham did. You could grab three highlighters for the next month. Every time Proverbs talks about a wise person, one color, foolish person, another color, evil person, another, another color, you'll learn incredible in the next month. These, these three types of people. Now, I want to describe them to you so you start to know who to trust, who not to trust, who to get in a relationship with, who to avoid. Here we go. Number one, wise people in the Bible, they're like shepherds. They're people who have biblical wisdom to steer the sheep. Now watch this. This doesn't mean they're the smartest people. Check this out. Knowledge comes from school. Wisdom comes from the Spirit. These are people who they've been filled with the Spirit of God. They love the Word of God. They have a heart for the people of God. They're willing to pour their lives out for the purposes of God. And how do you know somebody that's wise? Here's how you know. Proverbs says this about the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They're the person who knows what the will of God is and they have a reverence for God in their heart and so they obey him. This is the person who loves Jesus and ob obeys Jesus. They live by the spirit. They're positive for the things of God. Now, the second category of person, we're gonna call them a foolish person. Foolish people in the Bible, uh, they're like sheep. Sheep are a little dumb. Now, can I just say this real quick? Sometimes all of us act like foolish people. How many of you have done dumb things before? Mass confession. Okay, if you didn't put your hand up, that was a really dumb thing to do. That's what just happened. Because what you just did is, is like, you, you can't acknowledge what's going on. Now, now here's the thing about foolish people, according to the book of Proverbs, is watch this. It's not that they're stupid, it's that they're irresponsible. And a lot of times what's happening is foolish people, <laughs> they're irresponsible people looking for over-responsible people who will take care of all their problems that their irresponsibility created. So there's two types of people in this world. You'll notice this. Some people are burden lifters. You just see them coming and you're like, man, this person's gonna minister to me. They're gonna help me with a problem. They're gonna decomplexify something. They're gonna lift a burden off my shoulders. Some people are burden givers. Every time you see them coming, you're like, no, 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 no. Look the other way. You know, please, somebody else. Because they'll just walk up into the room, vomit all of their problems on you and then walk away. Like there's a, you deal with this thing. These are foolish people. Wise people make plans, foolish people make excuses. 
And the big thing that you'll notice about foolish people is they tend to deny reality. Watch this, especially spiritual foolish people. They're awesome at denying reality. So check this out. Like we want to believe in Jesus, but we also want to believe in math. So what a foolish person does is they'll look at their bank account and they'll be like, it's okay because I believe in Jesus. But it's like, yeah, but you also need to believe in math is what needs to happen. Or a foolish person will step on the scale and they can't see it. And it's like, hey, we need to believe in like math and like have a plan. So this is very often, this is the person that's like, man, they've got a good heart and they love Jesus. Sometimes this is a foolish person, good heart, love Jesus, but they're still figuring it out. Uh, like I, I talk about this all the time, You're still figuring it out, that's okay. Grow in, in their discipleship. My favorite compliment to receive in the lobby, I'm gonna use a word I don't usually use, I'm just gonna do it to be really raw. My favorite compliment to receive, I call them hell of a talk guys. They walk right out of the service. I, I, it's very obvious they never go to church. They just walk up and like, hell of a talk, brother. Hell of a talk. <laughs> hell of a talk. That's what I call them hell of a talk, guys. Uh, for, you know, these are the people, good heart. They're just figuring it out. Like the dude I prayed with that put the F word in his salvation prayer in the lobby. These are the, these are the people who drop bags of weed into the offering bucket, like actually, actually. And then everyone after them in the row has the decision, puff or pass. You have no idea. It's like, what am I gonna do? These are the people. These are real people. Now, let me just say this. Some of you right now, you're like, I don't like that he's, I don't like that those things were in here. Can I just say, God is going, I love that those people are in here. Because listen, Jesus said, I have not come. It is the healthy have no need of a doctor, but the sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Come on, man. That's why this thing exists. Now, so that's who, so we got wise people, we got foolish people. Now, third category, um, evil people are represented by the animal. Oh, here, here you go. Okay, now, let me, oh, that's the wrong one. Wrong one, that's the wrong one. That's, right. that's like my favorite joke. I do that like once a year. I get that in every year, okay? Really, evil people in the Bible, they, they're represented by, by wolves. Jesus warned, listen, this is gonna be important. He, he warned Christians, hey, as soon as I leave, wolves will come in among you trying to devour you. So here's who wolves are. They're people who oppose the things of God. Um, they're people who call the truth hate because the truth sounds like hate to people who hate truth. These are people who, listen, evil people are intentionally dangerous. They use their energy to create injury. Get this pattern in your head. Wise people, they live by the spirit. Foolish people live by the flesh. Evil people, they, are, they live by the demonic. They are demonically empowered to tear down and torment the people of God. Very often, just to be really honest, these are people who have experienced trauma or abuse in the past, and instead of bringing it to Jesus and laying at his feet in forgiveness, they gave the devil a foothold, and now he's climbed into their life, and they believe they have the right to hurt others because they got hurt. It became something in their life that consumed them, a window through which the demonic could enter in. So watch this. They experienced torment, so they torment. They experienced hurt, and so they hurt. Now, here's why I point this out. Because some of you are very naive, and you in your life say very naive things like, well, you just want to go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. I want friends who will cheer me on. Let me, can I just say this to you? Friends who will cheer you on all the way to hell are not your friends. And there are people in this world who will do that. Have you ever noticed this? Jesus called them wolves, wolves. Have you ever noticed this? He said wolves in sheep's clothing. He did not say they would be wolves in shepherd's clothing. There are some pastors, yes, pastors. I use that word very loosely. There are some evil pastors who are wolves in pulpits, but Jesus said what will be more common, wolves in sheep's clothing, church members. That's more common. Now here's what you'll notice. Here's why I say this. Just because they say they're believers does not mean you should believe them. This is very important. Don't watch what they say. Don't watch how they make you feel. Watch what they do. Do they act like disciples? This is important. Now, the greatest pain in your life will come from you treating one of those three categories as if it was one of the other three categories. If you treat a shepherd, if you treat the shepherds in your life like wolves and you run away from them or try to shoot at them, 
that will result in more pain in your life than you can imagine. If you treat wolves in your life like shepherds and you try to get real close, more pain in your life than you can imagine. So what I wanna do, I love you. I want you to know how you should relate to each category of people. Check this out. Here's what you should do. Wise people, you need to have a personal, you want, go ahead and do it, personal relationships with them. These are the people, when you figure out somebody's wise, you're going, dude, how do I just get close, man? I'll spend time, money, energy, anything I got to do. I just want to be, I just need to be near you. Check this out. Uh, when I first started, uh, I, I ran a lot of cross country in high school. My legs were a lot skinnier then. And uh, when, I, when I first started running my, my first race, I was like, dude, I think I'm like actually fast, man. Like I'm, I'm a natural. So I'm like running. I get to the last mile and it was like something just like, copped out in me. No joke, in the last mile of this race, I was a 17-year-old dude, okay? Like, good shape, 17-year-old dude. Last mile of this race, I got passed by a pregnant woman, (laughs) wait, pushing a baby in a stroller, okay? So I was like, dang, like, that didn't go as good as I thought it did. (laughs) So then there was a coach at our school. He's like, Josh, here's all I want you to do. Next race in two weeks, here's all I want you to do. I want you to find what we call a pace setter, So you just find somebody that's three or four minutes faster than your time just was. Here's, don't do anything different. Just try to keep your eyes on that person. And sure enough, next race, found a pace setter. All I did, I didn't didn't do anything different. Two weeks later, I I had a pace setter. My time was nearly four minutes faster that next race. Now, can I just point this out? You can't get four minutes faster in two weeks. So how did I run faster? Check this out. You can run faster, but even though you're not faster, if you just keep your eyes on the right people. Watch this in life. You can live wiser without actually even being wiser if you just keep your eyes on the right people. When you find somebody that's wise, you wanna go, man, I'll do anything it takes to get near you and be close enough to you so that I can see how you run. Now, with foolish people, here's what you need. You need a pastoral relationship. Hey, y'all. We don't shoot and ostracize sinners. Jesus was a friend of sinners. Just because somebody falls into sin doesn't mean we cut them out of our lives. So check this out. We don't cut them out, but we do help them up. These are people you have pastoral relationships with. Hey, let me pray with you. Let me love you. Let me send you a gift card. I'll meet with you. I'll help you. Let me, uh, let me invest in you. I'll disciple you. But it's a pastoral relationship. You're influencing them. They're not influencing you. And, and you need to, well, I'll get, to get there in a second. Now, when it comes to evil people, personal relationship, pastoral relationship, evil people, they need professional relationships. Here's the deal about evil people. They're not beyond help. They are beyond your help. They are beyond your help. They need professional help. They need Jesus. They need a treatment center. They need a counselor. They need a judge. Some of them need a jail cell. And some of you right now, you're like, yeah, but God can help anyone. Yes, he can, but you can't. You can't. And sometimes you have to look at somebody and go, man, they're not living by the spirit and they're not living by the flesh. They seem to actually be animated by the demonic. They torment everybody that they're around. And you need to have the ability to go, I need to step away and create a barrier so that you don't harm me with your wickedness. You gotta be able to do that. Now, let me, again, this was the second thing I felt led to do in sermon prep, so I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna step into a really uncomfortable spot. What becomes, put that back up there. What becomes really, really tough with this little grid right here is when you have a family member who is in the foolish or evil category and your entire family around you, now they start pressuring you to make them the exception to the Bible's rules about how you should relate to foolish and evil people. So like, here's what will happen, all right? You've got the drunk, angry, whatever it is, foolish, belligerent, overbearing father-in-law, makes everybody uncomfortable when he's around. And everybody's like, well, this is how I'm supposed to relate to people. I should be drawing some boundaries. But your entire family comes around you, starts pressuring you. Yeah, but he's your dad. Yeah, but they're family. And and listen, I'm especially, again, I'm I'm talking to men especially right now. Men, here's your responsibility in a situation like that. Everybody's gonna pressure you to make them the exception to God's rules. But watch this. They're gonna say, hey, they're they're your family. Yeah, but the book of Genesis said that when you married your wife and you started a family. It says that you left your father and mother, you cleaved to her and you started your own family. So you need to be the one that has the strength of character and courage to look at your family and go, hey, actually, you're not my primary family anymore. I left you to create my own primary family. And if I have to draw a boundary between you and my family to protect my family, I'm gonna stand up, act like a man and do it. 
So sometimes you have to have the ability to do this even when you get put in that really tough situation. Now, let me just, I, I need to bring all this to a close here. Let, let me just like land the plane on how this principle, I said at the beginning of this message, if you missed every other message I preached and got this one, you'd turn out okay. If you got every other message right, tried to lean into it, but you got this one wrong, you're never gonna make it. Let me show you why that is, okay? Now, go ahead and put the Corinthians verse up there. Now, I'm not gonna read this verse yet. Before I read it, you stay with me, but I want it up there on purpose, okay? It, when Paul writes this in ancient Rome, there were, just like in America, there were more conservative and more progressive parts of ancient Rome. Corinth was like, super progressive, like downtown Portland, ancient Rome. You just need to get this in your head. It was a college town. Everybody in the town was like young, educated, single. They were all waking up at the crack of noon and get, getting drunk on mimosas. They were making up pronouns and trying to get lucky all day. It was like everybody had my body, my choice on the backs of all their camels, all that stuff. And check this out. And, and, and they were deeply loved by Jesus. Deeply loved by Jesus. Now, in that culture, this more rebellious culture of Corinth, Paul gives, there's a reason he does it. In that culture, Paul gives his most direct, strident command to the Christians there about how to order their relationships. Heads up, hey, America, you live in Corinth now. You live in Corinth now. Paul is giving this instruction to people who lived in a culture like yours. And he makes it very direct on purpose. Check out what he says here. He says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Now, I just wanna point this out. Go to the next part of the ad. Keep it right there. I wanna point this out. He said yoke together. It's okay to have a pastoral relationship, an evangelistic relationship with unbelievers. You're actually commanded to do that. But he's saying your deepest personal relationships, no. No, now we'll hear why. Because what harmony is there between G Christ and Satan? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? Okay, this is the, I'm not supposed to, this is a Saturday night service. Can you guys handle two extra minutes of something that I wanted to say, but didn't, I'm not sure I had time to say, okay. okay. Y'all, this is my favorite, I love, this is my favorite service, okay. One of the great, so this is extra, next two minutes, parentheses. One of the great strategies of Satan, whose goal is to create confusion, is to take what God made binary and cast it as if it's a spectrum. That's like one of his great things. So watch this. What Satan does in the world is instead of good and evil, well, everything's more like shades of moral gray. Hey, instead of gender, male and female, it's more like a spectrum and there's hundreds of different choices. Uh, sexuality, instead of men like women and women like men, well, actually it's more like a rainbow. Uh, instead of true and false, binary, true and false. Well, actually, there's thousands of ways to God and there's lots of different opinions. So what Satan does is he wants to make a spectrum, but watch this, the Bible is extremely binary. There's Satan and God, demons and angels, lies and truth, sin and righteousness, heaven and hell, salvation and damnation. And you see, God is just, God is very, this is how the Bible works. The Bible is very binary. It's very black and white. Did you notice in that, go ahead and toss it back up there. In this passage, what, what this passage does, so what Satan wants to do in your life, I'm gonna have to put this in tomorrow, this is important. <clears throat> what Satan wants to do in your life is instead of you going yes and no to the people around you in your personal relationships, he wants to confuse you to go, well, you know, there's just, everybody's different in the name of, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, morally. Why don't you get, I need tons of different types of, no, 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 you don't. He's saying, no, 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 there are, Good, there are people who are good influences in your life and there are people who are bad influences in your life. Do this, don't do that. So watch the word that he uses. He says, don't be yoked. Now here's, so parentheses over. Let me get back to finishing my sermon. Don't be yoked. Now you guys know what a yoke is. A yoke is a chain. A yoke is a chain. So he says, hey, there's two types of people everywhere you go, okay? You, even wise, foolish, evil, you can still split them down the line, these two types of people. He's going, on the one hand, like, man, there's unbelievers, unrighteous, darkness, curse, Satan, idols. Heads up, y'all. 
God has a plan to bless your life. Satan has a plan to curse your life. Ultimately, you get to choose which path you're on. You get to choose. And he's going, hey, there's some people that are like this. And then he goes, hey, and there's some people like this. They're believers. They love righteousness. They're of the light. They bring blessing. They love Jesus. They love the church. And he goes, when you enter into a relationship with somebody, check this out. He's going, when you decide to like spend personal time with somebody, that choice, eventually you choose time with that person enough that it becomes a relationship. That relationship eventually becomes, watch this, an influence. And then one of the core needs of the human heart is to belong and to matter. And so then eventually that, that influence, it becomes a need and that need becomes a chain in your life. So what Paul is pointing out is that your relational choices become chains. Don't be yoked together. Watch this, he says with unbelievers. So here's how it's gonna work. Let me see if I can do this. Here's how it's gonna work in your life. Where's the thing? All right, I'll just do it up here. Here's how it's gonna work in your life. He's saying, man, when you spend all your most personal time with these types of people, it becomes a chain in your life And watch this, what will happen to you is even if you wanted to live that kind of life, a life of righteousness, light, blessing, Jesus, be with the church, the relationships that you're yoked to, you can't. Because every time you try to stretch this way, all your friends are like, bro, come back. Like, hey, come hang out with us, come do this thing. Don't go over there, we're over here. And now you've got a yoke to those people, you can't get over there even if you want to. But the implication is, check this out, that you can actually, here's what's important, choose your chains. You can choose your chains. Jesus said, my yoke relationship is easy and my burden is light. And when you begin to choose relationships with these types of people, it works the other way so that even at moments in your life, when you start like something, you start straying, you're like, oh, I'm trying to go back to my old life. All the people in your life, they come, hey, come back, bro. Don't go over there. Be with us. Let's follow Jesus together. Listen, y'all, choose your chains. Choose your chains. Choose your chains and choose that chain. And what you will notice, listen, if you separate yourself from the people of God, what you're doing is you're separating yourself from the supernatural work of God that can change your life forever. I want you to see an example of that in this couple story right here. I think we always knew we wanted to have a family. We were in a life group, we had friends, we had routine. We just decided it's time, let's, let's start our family. Most people don't get pregnant on their first month. Every month that goes by, you just lose a little bit of that hope. There is no pain like having to be around all your friends and feel like you can't be genuine. As our friends got pregnant, it's the epitome of I'm so happy for you and I am heartbroken for me. And it doesn't really hit until you get home. All those dreams that we talked about when we were dating and engaged, I don't think we're ever going to have that. While we're walking through infertility, your life keeps moving. Jordan got a new job. We built a house. We moved locations. And we still kept driving to Rockwall for our life group for months, like six months after we built the house. Because the farther you get into your infertility journey, the more alone you feel, the more the devil tries to isolate you. And you start feeling in your heart, are we really going to drive 45 minutes? We started asking God, what's next? And they had been talking about North Dallas and text 20411. And we heard Josh's New Year sermon at home of, you know, God's gonna do a new thing. And are you open to it? And from the moment we walked in the door, it just felt like home. I had about this much to give left in my life. And when I found about home groups, it was just in your home, meeting with people that you know, talking through the lesson, that was something I could do and that was something I could commit to. Before the first week when we decided to be very vulnerable, Kate and I had talked about, well, we're gonna put everything on the table and things could get really weird. I was blown away with how receptive our group was. We started that group in the very next month, we were six weeks in our home group and we got pregnant. 
it wasn't until a couple weeks later we find out we have twins. It was 31 weeks, and I just feel my water just broke. And I immediately start crying, and we've got to go to the hospital now. And you just say, God, no, God, please, please. They're 31 weeks. They wheel me off, and the doctor says they're stable right now, but I think you're having a placental abruption, which is fatal to them and to me. And then they put me to sleep, and it is only by God's goodness that I am alive today and that my children are alive today. There was a, one member of our group who God woke him up at 2.25 in the morning right when Kate got wheeled out and said, you need to pray for her life. And he did. There is nothing more supportive of our group than the power of prayer because anybody can bring food and they did and people can bring support and they did. But our group prays and we believe in the power of prayer and we believe in the gifts of the spirit. And we believe that if you ask, God listens. Through infertility, it was the hardest, most dark, deep suffering and pain we'd ever felt in our lives. The most amount of loneliness, dependence on God. But He is good, and His plan was better. And we are where we are today because God is good. We're, We're the, the Roikas, and, and this, this is how Jesus, Jesus changed our lives. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Hey man, let me just tell you this. Some of you, you think you are one book away, one podcast away, one habit away from changing your life. Let me just say this. You are one relationship away from the power of God flooding into your life through the people of God around you. And so listen, here's what's going on, man. This is a very weird service. This service is literally over right now. Like legit, it's over. I'm finishing it now. Don't start walking out. I got some instructions. Here's what's happening, okay? There are hundreds, even thousands of you who you've never taken a step into the family of God with a life group. Here's what's happening today. We wanna give you a chance to choose a chain and tether yourself to the people of God. You do this today, you will never regret it. So in one week this week, we are launching dozens and dozens, I think upwards of 40 or 50 brand new life groups for you to be in. So check this out. Here's what I'm asking. I'm asking you, if you're not part, actively a part of a life group, I am asking you to take this step to sign up, to test drive a group just for the next six weeks. That's it. I'm not asking you to get in until Jesus returns. I'm asking for the next six weeks. If you get in there and you're like, these people are weird. Yes, some of them are weird. And you, you have your pastor's permission in six weeks to leave the group and find the group with the non-weird people. You're allowed to do that. But I am asking you to take a step that will not just change your life, but may change your legacy and your family tree because dad or grandfather made a decision to connect himself to the people of God. So listen, here's how it's gonna work, man. We're launching all of them right now. We got all kinds of groups. We got men's groups, women's groups. They meet every day of the week, you name it. We got men's groups meet at 6 a.m. before work. We got like literally anytime, any day, we're taking away any, uh, any possible excuse. You, you know, you may go, yeah, man, Josh, but, I, but I, you know, I tried one and I didn't like it. Hey, well, you've eaten at restaurants before that you didn't like and you kept eating. Uh, you know, you know, you know, but, but, you know, I did one and it was, you know, the first time I went, some guys say this. Oh, the first time I went, it was kind of awkward. The first time you slept with your wife, it was awkward, but you kept giving that the old college try. And like, if something's important to you, it seems like you'll actually put forth the effort to do it. I'm telling you, this is something that change your life, your family's life. And some of you just come back to me, come back to me. Too distracting for me to use that joke. I'm asking you to take a step that may change your life and your family's life forever. So here's what I'm saying, man. Like, listen, here's my challenge. It's like, dude, we got your kids, your kids are fine. We got them for like, it's like 11 more minutes, you're fine. You're fine, we got your kids. There's nothing happening after this. I'm asking you, as soon as the music comes up, to text the word group to the number 20411. You'll see a little thing, just click through right there. You can see every group that's launching right now. I'm asking you to sign up for one to test drive it for the next six weeks. I promise you, you will never regret it. If you're like, oh, I'm not a phone person. At every single one of our campuses, we have an enormous number of people in these bright red shirts at the backs of uh, auditoriums and lobbies. Go find one of them and just be like, hey, help me out. Tell me about the things. But right now, I need you, if you are not actively committed to a life group, to text GROUP to 20411 or find some dude in a red shirt and take a step that may change your life. I love you. Go do it. I'm done.
Pentecost. Peace.